So malakut is our sense of being, our connectedness to the earth. It is our sensuality. It is our sensibility. It is our guiding sense. It is our sense of sovereignty. It is our sense itself. Because the earth is what wakes up the senses. It is the expansion, expansion of the inner perception to a world that challenges you at every time, especially in nature. Not so much locked in a room. Um, one of the ways that people all over the world acknowledge this was to go into caves and do ceremony. Because in caves, it's almost like it's sensory deprivation. And when you spend periods of time without senses, and you go back into the world, your senses are alive. With all systems of mysticism, we start at the base and go <coughs> up. You cannot just achieve things like that. You've got to work it. And you've got to work it and work it all the way up. They say religion starts at the top and draws God down. But mystics, they call them the upside down madmen. Because we take, we start with the ground and we build up. The whole idea of finding your reality is in mind. What is real to you? What makes sense to you? Until you develop this, you have nothing to rise from. So your sense of sovereignty is your soul in Malkut. Your ability to be real. And if you're not grounded, you're not going to have that solid sense of reality. This is a drawing of the Shekhinah. The earth, especially Malkut, is considered the body of the goddess, the body of the Shekhinah. Um, maybe there is a little bit to say that because in all the patriarchal religions, the feminine, the divine feminine has been pushed away, belittled, burned at the stake. Um, mysticism requires everyone to start with the feminine. The earth is a mother. She gave birth to us. Our dust is what we're made of. Her dust is what we're made of. And so before you embark on any mystical journey, you have to get sensitive. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be small and humble in her presence and let her hold you. Without that sensitivity, you can't go anywhere because even if you transcend into the deeper layers of yourself, if you're not sensitive enough, you're not going to sense what's there. <laughs> if you're not being guided by the mother, then when you go into your subconscious, you just get lost in all the images and dreams that are inside of you. So even in Tantra, we start with invocating Shakti. And in the Kabbalah, it is the Shekhinah, the divine angelic presence that is embodied in the universe itself. God is in everything. God is in trees, the sky, in that fan. <laughs> God is, is in everything that we behold and we're given the earth so that we have something to behold, so we have something solid and tangible to work with, to be able to figure ourselves out, to be able to do tikkunim, to be able to go, oh, that, that part of me is a bit wrong and make the adjustments. And the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge the divine feminine, your sensitive, vulnerable, creative self that is at the bottom of everything, receiving it all from above, so that you are totally encaptured by it. A good example is indigenous people, because indigenous people are always there. They're, they are the earth. The earth is there. They don't have that disconnection that we have from living in boxes and houses and, and not doing ceremony. And um, they, they are always in that energy. And as a result, they're very sensitive people. If you take indigenous people off the land, they get lost. It's like cutting their legs off. Um, the connection is lost. And with societies that have been lost from that connection, there's always this yearning of the soul to try and find that deep-rooted connection again. It's important that we do dig into the earth 
that we do acknowledge the land, that we do acknowledge where we stand, and to acknowledge all the elders, past and present, and all the Aboriginal people that have gone and created the ancestors that are still here amongst us and still guide us in this country today. And that part of us that acknowledges the ancestors of the land is Mark, <coughs> the kingdom. With colonisation, it's been very tricky. The British came here with its complete disrespect and degrading attitude towards Aboriginal people. As a result, the wisdom that they had was not passed on. And now it's almost like it's too late. So, the Aboriginal people that fire stick this land, that work the land, that had abundance of food, that learned to work with the climate, that learned to work with the seasons, we lost that. I've just been reading about the history of Melbourne, uh, of the Yarra, and how many times it flooded while they were trying to set the city up. This city was almost washed away like so many times, it's amazing. It's taken so long for them to tame the river, to tame the climate here, to dam it up in the mountains. But it's not meant to be that way. At the moment, that's how it is. With global warming, who knows what's going to happen. The fact is, the Earth Mother always takes back what's hers in the end, and we have to go with it. So, coming back to traditional Kabbalah. The Shekhinah, the goddess that dwells in Malkut, they say in Eden, in Genesis, and for those of you intrigued, um, Genesis chapter 1, especially, it's called Bereshit in Hebrew, um, where God creates the universe from nothing in seven days, is actually a magical allegory of the seven layers of the tree of life, creating light and, and humanity and the beings and all of that is actually a metaphor of magical process. In the mysteries of Genesis are all the secrets, but unlike the Masonic way, which gives you those secrets as you progress, the Hebrew secrets um, must be understood. I studied Hermetic Kabbalah for many, 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 many years and looking at all the Western occult systems um, that have gone through, that have influenced all the orders of knights, that have influenced the Templars, that have influenced the wizards that have been advisors to kings through the ages of European culture. There was something missing. So then uh, there was a point where I started reading the rabbis as well, and I missed the missing element was um, the essence of the Kabbalah, which is chasadim. Chasadim means acts of loving kindness. Without community, without giving and looking after each other and showing love to each other, what's the point of magic? Who cares if you can get something through magic or you can achieve this prestige? If love isn't there, you've missed the point. And the good thing about that side of the Hebrew Kabbalah is that it keeps it human. Because magic and working with the gods can make you feel a bit like a god. And ego inflation is the last thing you want when dealing with these forces. Because as soon as you lose that base, that sensitivity, that vulnerability that the mother gives us so that we can be aware of all things, you usually fall at some point anyway. And so this shows the temple, Solomon's temple in Judea, in Jerusalem. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant, which was placed in it, they say the Shekhinah dwelt on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Once a year, the high priest would go in and there would be incense, and the mother would appear and speak to him from the Ark of the Covenant. The mysticism of the Holy Kabbalah first inspired me um, from the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> that movie and the whole feeling of this box that allows you to communicate with God, that had a goddess that sat in the smoke on it and spoke and gave instructions to the prophets that wielded it, blew me away. And I've spent my whole life studying it and travelling around the world and verifying it 
and many people. The Ark of the Covenant now, they say, resides in Ethiopia in a city called Aksum. I went there just before COVID and I actually met the priest who looks after it. And no one's allowed to see it, of course. <laughs> and in Ethiopia, every single church has its own little ark, but the actual ark um, is in Aksum. Ethiopia has a totally different perspective of history and they have a long presence of Hebrew worship, including the worship of Yahweh and his wife, which was omitted from a lot of the Western practices, called Ashira. Ashira was the grove goddess. And in Ethiopia, if you wanted to worship the one god, you would go up a hill and there would be one tree with an altar. And you'd do ritual around that altar. And if you wanted to worship the goddess, you went down into the valley where there was a grove of trees and an altar. And amongst the circle of trees, you would call the goddess. And between those two extremes, well, that's our cosmic identity. You know, we all come from a father and a mother. And that's the way. And those places are still there in Ethiopia today. It's one of the most un appreciated countries as far as mysticism goes. So the Ark of the Covenant um, was a historical device for communicating with God through the angels and through the mother of all angels, the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah was transposed in Christianity into the presence of the Virgin Mary. And even though some of the elements of it were missing, that she still carried on because everyone feels this yearning for the divine feminine presence to help them, to be with them, to guide them. And it guided the Jews through the wilderness to take Judea as their own, which is now Jerusalem itself. But when Babylon sacked this beautiful temple and tore it down, and then later the Romans did it again, they say the Shekhinah wandered with her people and she's no longer just in Israel, in these ruins, that she's wherever you go. And so the practice of holy Kabbalah ritually is to recreate that temple in your soul and to go in and go to that inner sanctuary inside yourself and in the smoke and the lid of the ark of the box that contains all your holy wisdom and understanding, you let the voice speak directly to you. And that inner listening, that deep listening that allows your highest, highest conscience to come through is what Kabbalah tries to help you to bring about. To listen to your highest spirit and to follow that highest spirit. Because hearing the spirit is one thing, doing what it says and having enough faith to see that it's a valid advice. Here's another a beautiful artistic representation of the Shekhinah. It's interesting the idea of the serpent, which is considered one of the great symbols in all traditions, all mystical traditions, as sensual power, um, natural flowing. Um, the Irish sort of turned the serpent into a nasty thing that you had to kill and step on. But in Tantra, the serpent is that energy that uncoils and lifts up inside of you and opens all your senses up. There's, I've seen a friend of mine's got a plastic statue of the Virgin Mary in his backyard stepping on a snake and it's coming out from under her dress and it looks a bit suggestive to tell the truth. But that was taken from the earlier traditions of the goddess and her relation to the serpent. The serpent is just our spine, really. You know, it's the simplest animal when it comes to the spine. Um, in some countries, you know, a lot of people look at snakes and they're afraid, they feel fear. Um, I'm not like that. I'm a keen environmentalist um, and I love it when times here. Um, I don't see snakes as evil, I just see them as another animal that if you leave them alone, I'll leave you alone. Um, Never had a bad experience with a snake. I see them all the time down the river. Um, so the whole idea of the sensual, 
coming in and lifting you up and awakening you. In the Kabbalah on the Tree of Life, as that uncoiling happens and lifts up through the senses and awakens every layer of your being, in Sanskrit they call it sushuna, a rising sense of sensual ecstasy as your senses open. It happens when you dance, it happens when you make love, it happens when life exhilarates you, you wake up, you, you feel all your being working. And in modern society, there's all these things that kill that off. You know, pharmaceuticals and, and bad culture and bad ideas and bad religion and bad food and all these things that just keep the snake down in the earth and stepped on. This image shows, even though she's stepping on it, she's not trying to squash it. She's almost letting it rise. And that's more in keeping with Tantra, the traditions of the East as well, where the serpent is seen as the awakening of the senses, the awakening of our inner power, the awakening of ourselves on all levels, to feel our consciousness streaming through our peripheral nervous system. This is an ancient um, depiction of Ashira, the wife of Yahweh, the grove goddess that worshipped the divine feminine in the traditions of early Kabbalah or Hebrew. Another image of Ashera holding her breasts of fertility. And another one. With the Masonic symbolism a bit more, we have the pillars of Yachin and Boaz. Um, in Kabbalah, there are two pillars, the white pillar and the black pillar, and then there's a third one in the middle. The white pillar is called the pillar of mildness, or the pillar of, sorry, the pillar of mercy, the uh, outward expression into the world. The black pillar is absorbing it's the inner realm. It's the struggle, it's the comprehension. And the middle pillar, the pillar of mildness, is the path of the mystic. The whole point of the three pillars of the Kabbalah, um, which rise from Malkutta, is that we can never really find our centre and go straight towards the divine and back if we don't know our periphery. And all the experiences we have in life, all our trials and our errors, or every time we fall, every time we bounce off the sides of the world and get pushed back in, Every time we get sick, every time someone betrays us, every time we do something and we realise how wrong we were, we come back to the centre. We come back to the centre. The tree of life is a system that helps you to recognise that a little more readily so that you can understand where you are in your centre and also your boundaries, how far you can extend either one way or the other. They say the black pillar is the right side of your body, the feminine the part of you that falls down to the earth in creation. And the masculine is the right, right, sorry, the left white pillar that rises up the left side towards God in a striving. And in this you have a circle, which is like the yin and yang. The feminine creates the earth, the masculine rises up to bring humanity to its peak. And these two dynamic energies um, are the two pillars on the outside. The mystic, however, goes in the middle, androgynous, both male, female, and neither. Pure hermetic um, wisdom, the high priestess, the part of you that connects earth through your loins to your heart to the heavens and stays centered and is not distracted or tempted away from that pure presence, that pure presence. So, when you are conceived, when your parents are making love and that spark of orgasm happens, which, <laughs> which calls your soul into and habit one cell, which then becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes sixteen, and so on and so forth. When that spark of orgasm which is the gateway that brings your soul into the womb of your mother happens. That energy that comes from the spark that is um, predates, or, or how do you say, preliminates 
the actual physicality of the cells themselves. The cells would not even do anything if there wasn't a force moving them to do it. And so, even down to a genetic level, there's a force moving you to evolve from a little cell into a baby, into a full-grown adult. This is Yesod. This is the foundation of who you are. And Yesod is the gateway to the astral planes. Where Malchut is the physical Earth, Yesod is the electromagnetic astral body which sits in and sublimates your physical body. This astral body can leave the physical body and fly around and do all sorts of wonderful psychic things. And it can also go into the realm of dreams. In essence, when we learn Kabbalah, we go astral. We go from the earth into our astral body and from the astral body into the astral planes, which are the higher levels of the tree. The astral planes, now, most people think of astral travelling as remote viewing sort of thing where you, you know, finally get out of your body and you look at your body's laying there asleep and you go, oh, I'm out of here and you run off and you fly off or whatever. And that's an amazing experience. I've had that many times. But after a while, when you are in your astral body, you'll start seeing things that are closer to dreams. And that's because underneath our physical body, and within our um, electromagnetic spectrum are the what they call the storehouse of images, our dreams. Our dreams are symbolic ways of guiding our soul. Dreams show truth. Dreams hold in them the symbols of what we're going through, what we're letting go of, and what we're embracing, what's coming to us in the future, so they're not governed by time. As a matter of fact, something that may be coming to us, we may dream of way before it happens. And we may not dream of it directly, but just a symbol of it. So this all is about learning symbolism. In the uh, Golden Dawn, they, they say that you have to stop thinking in words and start thinking in images. The ability to comprehend Symbols is about Yesod. Yesod is um, the vision of the machinery of things. It is the part of you that looks at a human body and understands all the anatomy and physiology that makes it up. It is the part of you that can look at a car engine and figure out how it works. How it works. If you, it's a part of you that looks at a computer and knows all its working parts. It's a part of you that looks at a tree and understands how the fluids go up and the energy comes from the leaves down, and you've got this machine-like behaviour. It's the part of you that looks at climatology and understands that it's also like a big machine. So yes, it is pure imagination. In the old, when I grew up, imagination was always debased. I don't quite understand why. Imagination is the key to everything. If you can't imagine it, how can you possibly even conceive it? And so people that want to dominate your imagination and tell you how it is, they're the ones that usually tell you that it's just your imagination, as if it's nothing. Imagination is the ability to place an eye in place of an eye, an ear in place of an ear, a heart in place of a heart, a likeness in place of a likeness. When a baby is born, it's just waving around, its astral body is much stronger than its physical body, and it takes a while for it to realise, oh, I've got hands. And then it starts becoming present in its hands and moving its hands. And then it becomes aware of the sounds it's making, and it realises, oh, I can control these sounds through this mechanism. So when we're very young, we have to um, learn to sit from our astral energy into our physical body as we grow. And it's the same as we get older. We need to learn to coordinate from our subconscious into our physical body. The ability to sit and play a piano for music. The ability to design a house and then create it and build it. All of these things come from Yesod. Yesod is the founding creative part of you that creates with the earth itself. 
There is another level of creation which sits above, which is creation from God, which we'll go into a bit later. But yes, Lord is working with the lower foundation. Yes, Lord is in a triangle called the nefesh, which means the vitality. And in yes, Lord, if your sexual energy is intact, if your ability to communicate and make exchanges with people is good, um, to have good trade, um, if your perceptions are acute, and if your artistry is refined, then yes, Lord is well developed. It is the part of you that understands um, how to imagine yourself in a greater light. Yes, Lord, just to go into it, is ruled by the Archangel Gabriel. Gabriel is the angel of the Apocalypse who blows the trumpet and wakes the dead up. That is also a symbolic metaphor because when Gabriel comes, you wake up. You wake up to who you are. You wake up to what's going on and you show better judgment. The idea of not having judgment is a very religious New Age thing to try and escape negativity. In the old language, judgment was also an inclusive concept for higher discernment. I grew up with my grandmother not far from here, and she said it's about showing better judgment. Because without judgment, you won't be able to cross the road without getting hit by a car. Judgment is important. Shallow judgment is a dilemma. <laughs> it just stifles you. Showing better judgment on how to live life is also a part of your imagination. Parents have to do this all the time. Parents have to judge what is good and bad for their children to create rules and obstacles or allowances to allow them to go out and experience things for themselves. So, yes, as I was saying, is the lunar deities. Here is the ancient Greek goddess Selene, Artemis. Here's another beautiful portrayal of the lunar goddess. Artemis. And here's his portrayal of the original lunar god from Sumeria called Sin. It's where we get the word Sin from. This original cult was the oldest cult in Sumeria. And they worshipped the moon um, and they worshipped the imagination. In a time in history where we were just starting to imagine how things worked. And so experimentation was um, encouraged. And back then, you know, the idea of figuring out how the body works would have required you to dismember it. Um, this has always been a touchy subject because even our modern Western medical system was based on thieving corpses from graveyards and cutting them up and putting them on display. The cult of sin was just about doing ritual to enhance your imagination. This included explorations of sexuality, um, of all, all sorts of interactive things, but it was the basis to the building of the Sumerian culture. And here we have a, a very early sealed depiction of sin, the god of imagination, the god of the lunar power. Here we have the Egyptian god of the moon. And another beautiful portrayal of a masculine lunar energy. The lunar energy has got three main components. The male is virility, the female is fertility, and when you place them together you have creativity. And they are worshipped those primary factors in all pagan culture. Without those, you can't create anything. And all the pagan cultures of the world, they created the foundations of civilization. They built the first cities, they built the first temples, they understood the cycles of nature, they created civilization as we know it. The oldest cults in Sumeria, um, were at fresh, water springs. 
Um, because the Middle East has got a lot of desert, if you found a freshwater spring, it was a hole. And they had uh, more than 100 a uh, male priest and a female priest that lived and guarded the freshwater springs wherever they were in the Middle East. And they were called the muddy ones, the great muddy ones, because when the water came out, it was all muddy. <laughs> and they would wear the mud and they were shown to look after the springs. You know, it was one of the greatest resources that you had. In Australia, when they first came here, the drivers started taking their cattle through the central Australian desert, and there are only a few clear water holes in the deserts of Australia. The drivers took their cows there, they shattered it, they decimated these holy places that the Aboriginal people revered and needed to survive. The idea of a freshwater spring was the pure essence of the Esau. In ancient Greece, before the Hellenic period, they worshipped a primary goddess and they connected her to the moon and the earth. Women believed back then um, that men had nothing to do with getting pregnant. <laughs> if they wanted to get pregnant, they went into the river near the freshwater spring, they opened themselves to it and they invited the soul of the child to come inside them. And in a way, it's quite beautiful. <laughs> and understanding the Esau is all about imagination. It's the way we interact with our astral body in with the spirits of the earth and the universe around us. Now we go to Chod. Chod sits here on the right waist. It equates with your mind, your intellect. It is what they call the intellect of Thieves, because it is spontaneous and quick-witted. It is the part of you that dresses in black and climbs in someone's window really quietly and tries to avoid the dog and wants, you know, you've got to sneak past them, they could be asleep in their room. And all those little things the mind comes so awake with. They call it the intellect of thieves because when your mind is totally awake, you have that same heightened awareness. An ability to be constantly in thought on every single thing that's around you on the levels. It is also our sense of identity, our voodoo, our inner power. And identity is symbolized more by music and song, um, by prose, by philosophy, by theory by the things that the mind produces than by images. So where Yeslot is about imagination, Hod is about thinking, theorising, philosophising, calculating, puzzle solving. It's the part of you that figures things out. Here we have a wonderfully illustrated drawing of Hermes Trismegistus, the personification of Hod, of Mercury. And as you can see at the top, the divine name of God, Yod, Chi, Vav, Chi, fire, water, air, earth, wands, cups, swords, pentacles, north, south, east, west, and so on. The great mind of the ancient pagan world Hermes was said to create writing. Hermes was said to set the cornerstones of the temples and pyramids. Hermes was said to calculate all the mathematics involving the ancient architecture. Hermes was also said to create the summer, a holy drink that awakened the soul to the divine world of the angels. Hermes was in Egypt called Tot, the ibis headed god. And when the Greeks invaded Egypt, instead of destroying their culture, they took it on. They married in with their monarchy and they created the Ptolemaic era of pharaohs. Greek and Egyptian philosophy merged as one, creating the tradition of Hermeticism. Tot was the god of writing, magic, healing, music. And 
all things involving the mind and intellect. Netzach sits on the opposite side of the body at the left waist in the white pillar. Even though it's feminine, it sits on the base of what we call the masculine pillar. Just to say something on that, even though we divide this into male and female and this side and that side, it's really only so your base intellect has something to grab hold of. In the end, Mars is not male, Venus is not female. Most cultures in the world worship Venus as a male energy. In Mexico and South America, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, is Venus. Um, in most places in the world, it's very male. And there's plenty of angry women out there to personify Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just something to start you off, to give you a basic structure. Very similar like when you learn a language like French or Italian, that have male and female words, which is like, you know, why is a dog female or this or that, you know? It's just to give your mind something to grab onto. They say that as you rise up the tree, everything's rigid and straight. But when you reach Chokma at the top of the right side, it's no longer straight. The ladder disappears and it's all spirals. And it comes back to the original Sufi premise that everything is turning. There are no straight lines. Everything is spinning. But until we get to that top spinning place, we need a ladder. We need to be solid. We need to have a step-by-step -step process. Otherwise, we get lost. Can I just please ask? You mentioned before organs. Yeah. So, liver, spleen? No, no, no. So, the sifirot are systems of organs. The digestive system is related to hot, the part of us that takes things in, breaks them down, processes, processes them, and then expels what we don't need. Same way the mind does. We take in information, we think about it, then we get rid of it, and we keep the bits of knowledge like little jewels. Venus is the um, uh, lymphatic system. It is the part of your body that drains the fluid from the organs back into the blood. It is the part of us that feels. It also has part of our immune system because the lymph nodes clean the fluid as it goes back into the bloodstream. So my kinesiologist mind in traditional Chinese medicine just kicked in and there's a link. Yes, of course there is. And I've got a friend who practices Chinese medicine and more and more we're talking and realising that systems are very correlated. Yeah, yes. um, Chinese medicine is very interesting because it looks at the body not as a clunky machine thing that you cut up and drug, but as a climate with rising damp and heat and swirling energies of electricity that you can manipulate. It's quite a different system. It's very hard to get your mind around when you grow up with Western medicine. Big man. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Netzach means victory or firmness or eternity. Netzach is, to me, one of the ultimate images of Netzach is at the end of World War II. I don't, most of you may have seen that um, film uh, of the man in Elizabeth Street when Melbourne was filled with people celebrating the end of the war and there was a man dancing, the dancing man. This sense of victory. When we are on top of our emotion, emotions, we feel victorious. When we're not, we feel like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and we've got to struggle to figure them out. And you can't figure out your emotions by thinking. You've got to feel. You've got to wear your shit. <laughs> you've got to own it. You've got to display it. You've got to interact with others that feels in a similar way. So Netzach is Venus. Netzach is Aphrodite. Netzach is Inanna, Ishtar. Netzach is the part of us that wears the layers of the soul. Netzach is the part of us that is fashion, food, culture. Whereas Hod is the intellect, the thinker. Netzach is what they call dinner table intelligence. 
when you sit around and because of food being present, you think in a different way, you communicate in a different way. If Hod is the old man, then Nesach is the old woman, the grandmother and the grandfather that guide us. In Kabbalah also there is a correlation between the two different sides. Some people are intellectual more than emotional. Some people think and become nerds. <laughs> Some people are more cultural, fashionable and creative and artistic. And they have the problem of becoming melodramatic. Without thinking, your emotions can go crazy. Without feeling, the thinkers will not look after themselves and won't live a good life. Venus is about living good culture. When you work Netzach, you develop your lifestyle. You develop what you eat. You develop good relationships and loving, caring tenderness with people and the environment around you. When you're in Chod, you activate your mind. You follow your interests and your intrigues. You question. You figure things out. You, you go... You fall into the wondrous depth of the universe. But Venus is about beauty, triumphant. Venus is about acknowledging the lion's mane, the glow of the flowers in a bush, the beauty of a river, the um, sensuality of a person walking past. Um, it is about engaging in the artistry and the culture of things. And Melbourne is a very Venus city. As a matter of fact, cities do predominate in planetary energies. Melbourne, which has always been the capital of fashion, food and culture, is similar to what Paris is for Europe, what Shanghai is for China. Um, there are cities that are cultural capitals all over the world in different places, and there are cities void of it. <laughs> so Venus is the feeling, Hod is the thinking, and between the mystic dances with thoughts and feelings in the base, in the nefesh, and thoughts and feelings shape the way we imagine things. We imagine things and are influenced to imagine them in a way from the way we think and the way we feel. If we cultivate our feelings by living good, healthy life, then our imagination will be good and healthy. And if we follow our intrigues and our scientific ways of discovery, we will embody the truth in our imaginings. Those make up the new fish, our vitality, our connection to the astral planes the way we connect in with all the spirits of people, the animals, and the earth itself. Here we have an old card in the Nana, The beautiful painting of Venus, Aphrodite. Botticelli. And an arm, Easter. Tifavet. There is a lot to be said about Tifavet. Tifavet in Hebrew means beauty. Tifavet is the center, so it connects to more paths than any other city of art. If you fold the whole tree in on itself, Tifilah is all that's left. The heart, the centre, the luminous presence of the soul, the Ruach. Tifilah has the vision of harmony. And harmony implies good relationships with all things. So your ability to relate to all the other qualities of the Tifilah are centred from Tifilah. Tiferet is the healer, the part of you that receives the spirit and allows it to create harmony in yourself. Tiferet is also what they call the vision of the great work, your sense of purpose.
purpose. When you awaken and are initiated into Tiferet, instead of being proud, you put your head down and show purpose because there's always something more to do to bring harmony, if not into yourself, into the world around you. It is the Christ center because the Son dies and resurrects every day. It is the part of you that learns how to die, go through the underworld and re-emerge. And there are periods in our life where that happens in cycles. It is the path of Ra in ancient Egypt, the sun god that crosses the sky and then dies as Osiris and goes to the underworld, reborn through Isis and then is reborn as Horus, very similar to the Christ myth. So, the sun is the part of us that is simply present. There is a, an experience, a garment called the chashmal. Chashmal means speaking in silence. When you are in your nefesh and you are doing an astral ritual, they say that you put on the garment of chashmal and it dispels all sitra acha, all negative inclinations and you rise through the planes and layers of your soul towards God and have visions and then bring back that wisdom and process it. The garment, the chashma, the speaking silence is the part of you that is in a state of silent presence. In um, Sanskrit they call it the Shabda Brahma, the sound of God. The, and they say it's like a river of silence that flows constantly through the heart. They also call it a nachkam. A nachkam means the unstruck sound, like you were about to bring some symbols together. And in that moment, right before the symbols hit, that anticipation, that presence. In Tiferet is your ability to be present. And ultimately, that's all there is. That's all you can do. The rest of it is just complications. <laughs> If you can just sit in your own silent centre state of witness and be present and feel that river of silence that beholds and emanates beauty and sees beauty in all things, then you are in Tiferet. The Native American culture has an idea called the beauty way and it's about seeing beauty in everything, even the macabre, even the underworld, even the dark. There is beauty in everything. By doing this, you can look on things indifferently, without judgment. Tiferet is um, all the solar deities, like Apollo, like Eli, Elios, like Surya. Um, I, I once went to a sun temple in Rajasthan in India, and it was a bit full on. Um, first of all, we had to go up this hill in the middle of Jaipur. And um, uh, there were monkeys everywhere, and they were really savage, and they had bulbous cancers hanging off them, and they weren't very savory. Um, and so we had to hire a little boy with a stick <laughs> to keep the monkeys off us. And we got up the hill, and then right as we got to the temple, there was a sadhu with his family, and he was standing greeting us like, like the sun, arms open, very Jesus-like. But to get to him, we had to walk through a um, horde of, of hornets. <laughs> and we're looking at these hornets, they were the biggest things I'd ever seen, these flying insects. And they had big pointy stings, and the sadhus just going, just walk through them. Just walk through them. I'm just looking at them going, yeah, right. <laughs> but we did, and they buzzed around our heads and freaked us out, and we got into the temple. This temple was designed on this hill so it could map not only the path of the sun precisely across the sky over the city, but also the stars at night. Um, solar worship um, designated the solstices and the equinoxes. The ability to do ceremony at the major points of the sun through the year is one of those ritual practices that goes way back in 20 Without acknowledging the solstices and equinoxes, you're not really sort of 
getting those energies and reaping the reward from them. The four letters in the name of God, the four elements are worshipped at the four solar points of the year. At the winter solstice, we have a seer, the earth, when, the, when it's coldest. In spring, it's water, when it rains, when it, the rivers fill up, when, when creation happens. And summer is the fire, and in autumn, where we are now, is the air, when we have these beautiful temperate days, which we're missing out on. <laughs> so the solar energy is about being sensitive, being present, being harmonious, and having good relationships with everything. Here we have one of the ultimate places where the sun's passage was marked by pyramids. One of the rituals for the ancient Egyptians, um, there's a miseducation from scientific communities that says they're all tombs. They weren't tombs, they were places to initiate people. Pharaohs were taken up the, up the Nile, they were probably given some extreme intoxicant that made them very sensitive. They were taken into the pyramids, they were laid in the open sarcophagus, and then the Tibet, the, so the Egyptian book of the dead, was chanted over them. Now I've been in these pyramids and I've chanted inside the king's chamber, and there is a resonance in there that goes to every cell in the body, especially if you do it in the dark. So imagine this, if you were that pharaoh laying in a sarcophagus in the middle of a giant pyramid with priests chanting the story of how the soul can become its best all night long, and then you come out of this extremely confronting experience as the sun rises and you stand between the feet of the sphinx and watch the sun rise over the Nile towards you. Great leaders were once initiated, not made. They didn't, you didn't vote for them. They were people that were educated. They were developed, they evolved into these beings that allowed them to take on the responsibility of ruling. The soul of deity is all about the layers of initiation to make you more luminous, more centered, and to have better relationships with all things. If a ruler does not have a proper relationship with all things, then he will not rule to protect those things and to preserve them. And so in all solar cults, it's to bring out your best, your most luminous, present soul and self. They call Tiflet the higher mind, the classical mind. Here we have an Egyptian symbol of the Atom, the solar disk which was worshipped by the pharaoh Akhenaten. Here we have in Japan, just to be a little different, there's a few places in the world that have solar goddesses. Um, in Japan, Amaterasu Omikami, which this is a beautiful modern painting of, um, was the sun goddess. The Japanese monarchy is said to have descended from her. There they have a sun goddess and they have an earth god. And the earth god is very grumpy and likes to destroy things and gets violent. He's a bit samurai-like. And she's perfectly harmonious and luminous and noble. One of the qualities of Tifavet is to understand your own inherent nobility. Apollo, Greek god. And a beautiful Kabbalistic drawing showing the names of God and the Christ, Christus, the solar center. There is in Tifabet a messianic culture that comes from it. Messiahs are not born, they are made. They are forged by cultures that systematically invite them in. In the Gnostic tradition of ancient Egypt during the Ptolemaic era, when the mysticism of ancient Egypt mixed with the mysticism of ancient Greece 
and ancient Israel because there are a lot of uh, Hebrews who are migrating in and becoming part of Egyptian society, they formed what was called the therapeutate. Therapeutate is where we get the word therapeutic from. These people created the first ever hospitals in history. They were into all forms of magic and healing. And they had all these wondrous and amazing techniques for doing it, including using sound. The therapeutate and later the Gnostics um, created varying cultures based on liturgies to produce a Messiah, a Christus, a holy being that would save and guide humanity. When Christ was born, a lot of the Gnostic societies saw him as the totality, as the born Messiah. Christ was not the Jewish Messiah, even though they also had an idea of a Messiah. The Jewish Messiah was a different concept to Christ. He wasn't um, a wandering teacher. The Jews believe that the coming Messiah in their faith is going to be probably more like a political leader that reorganises the substructure of society so that we all get along. And so everything starts to work and organise a bit better. And so every culture has its messiahs. The Jains in India don't worship gods, they worship a string of messiahs going up to the last one called Mahavira. So messiahs are part of the solar cult. And drawing out your Christus, your inner um, Christ self, your messianic resolve, your ultimate luminous present soulful being, is what Tiferet is about. Mars. <coughs> Mars sits there and is equated with the right arm that holds the sword. Chesed, which is opposite, holds the scepter and is a sense of bestowal and grace. This is where we also get the tradition of the knife and fork. So many little things laced in our modern society come from the symbolism of ancient rituals. Even the way our houses are designed, with the bedroom, the master bedroom, the this and that, comes from places like the Temple of Luxor. That's where we got the idea of designing our houses. A lot of the ancient mysteries can be verified because they are still alive and thriving underneath our communities. For instance, the Essene societies in Israel, the mystics, the Jewish mystics that lived outside of Judea in um, places like Qumran, they had uh, two systems of priests, light and dark, just like the Kabbalah. The names of the light priests were given the names of angels of light. The names of the dark priests were given the names of demons. The chief spokesman was called Michael, Michael. And he was the one who greeted anyone that would come to the monastery. The chief antagonist was called Satan. Satan. And so he was the one that nitpicked everything and had to always show the adverse negative side of things just to keep everyone in check. So you won't all be hospitable. This level of the tree is the yes, no, do, don't. Mars constricts. Mars is where all tension and anger and conflict is gathered and therefore it's where we access our demons because it's where we're most challenged. They call the black pillar the pillar of severity because it's how we deal with severe things in life, harsh things, hard things, so that we have to rise and show some courage. Mars, Gevorah, which means strength or rigour, um, or severity is our sense of discipline, it is our sense of going to war, it is our sense of inner struggle and fight for peace. But Givulha is a feminine word and it actually means not outward aggressive grunt, it means inner strength. The strength of the Sufi, the part of us that struggles inwardly. Even the word Israel means he who contends or wrestles with the divine and comes from the story of Yaakov wrestling with the angel in the desert. When we
we have to do something that confronts us, we start to resist, we struggle. We have to develop courage, discipline, forethought, and strategy to be able to deal with the things that, struggle, that challenge us. Judgment comes into this din in its most harsh form in Givora, in Mars. The ancient Greek form of Mars was all about war and violence. And indeed, it is the way we deal with war and violence. It's interesting at the moment, now wars are on telly. Um, it doesn't have to escalate because when someone goes to war, like what's happening in the Ukraine, the whole world condemns it. This is something that's never happened before, where we can all witness a war and everyone's collective psyche and prayers and opinions and efforts can be to condemn a war. And this will be affected by the perpetrators. You know, we all have to stand together and fight for peace in our own little ways. That's all we can do. And that war is extended to the war to save the environment, the war to save the human soul, the war to save our culture, the war to preserve things that are meaningful and enriching for us. Mars is also, um, especially in our African voodoo, associated with the doctor. The one that goes in and sees what's wrong, where the conflict is, and figures out the right technique to fix it. Technicalities are part of Mars. The ability to see what's wrong and find the technique to fix it. Here we have one of the warrior gods of Egypt, Horus feeding eternal life to the Pharaoh, giving him the life of Mars, of strategy of war. A Roman version of Mars. And the Greek version. There is Chesed. So as I said before, Mars is the hand that holds the sword. Chesed is Jupiter, the benevolent father. Jupiter rules the things that take a long time in life to do, to build our careers, to find our ultimate home, to gather our legacy, to be able to pass something on to humanity. It is love, it is kindness, it is um, establishment. It is our greatest sense of humanity and holiness installed in humanity. It is civilization rising to its flourishing, blossoming peak. Jupiter as a planet protects us. Without Jupiter there, the entire solar system would be unstable and we probably have asteroids colliding with us a lot more often. Most of them just get sucked into Jupiter. So, physically and symbolically and archetypally, Jupiter is our protector and our benevolent benefactor. Jupiter is often portrayed as a benevolent king who bestows upon you riches, wealth, land, title, and all the things you need to become a great human being. Chesed is order. And in a way, it's sort of really the core of this entire system because this is just a system to create order in your mind and your soul and to have something to map everything on to create an ordered system. Chesed is holiness. Here we have the old uh, artistic recreation of the Temple of Zeus in Athens. Beautifully, beautifully made. All the great benevolent father gods like Jupiter, Marduk, were all of Chesed. And here we have Zeus with his lightning bolt. Within all of this, uh, so many allegories and stories and truths and hidden history. 
histories. The one thing the Kabbalah has kept in its wellspring of knowledge is hidden histories. Because throughout history, history has been written by the victors, by the political dominators. But underneath, the true histories have been kept by the occultists, by the scholars, by those who don't care about politics, and to find out these writings which record the ancient ways, um, uh, jewels of knowledge which are filled in the Kabbalistic tradition and the Hermetic tradition, to find the secret histories, to find the books that were omitted and edited out of the Bible and out of the Torah, to find the um, histories that were omitted from the books 